So I want to uh, pick up this morning, uh, so we've been going through the Gospel of John, and we're, we are picking up uh, back at this festival that Andrea referenced uh, earlier. Uh, but I was thinking of a fellow uh, this week as I was studying uh, Frank Abagnale Jr. Um, most of you would be familiar, if you're familiar with the name, it's from the movie Catch Me If You Can, uh, where Tom Hanks played, played this guy, about uh, a fellow who uh, spent several years of his uh, teens and early 20s um, traveling and passing fraudulent checks and, and becomes quite wealthy uh, in, the, in the enterprise, but spends it pretty quickly too. Um, so the events of the movie are largely based on, on his life and fairly accurate, but what I wanted to share with you was uh, a bit that happens right after the movie. Well, actually, I guess in the epilogue, they kind of show a few moments of it, but they largely gloss over it. So he actually gets caught. Um, he does a, a lot of uh, his fraud in America, passes as an airplane pilot, uh, comes into a new city and, and on, it's the 60s, so basically on the premise of having a pilot's uniform, he, he can cash a lot of checks and then, ho and then hop town. But he does this all over the world, actually. So he, by, the, by the time he's caught, he's wanted in a number of countries, including France, which is where he gets arrested uh, initially. Um, the interesting part of his story is he's, he wrote a book on it, uh, which the movie is based on, but the interesting part of his story to me was his jail time in France. So it wasn't a huge, like he wasn't a violent offender or anything like that, so I think he gets sentenced to something like two years and it ends up being a little less than a year that he's in jail. But his comment on, on being in jail in France in the 1960s was they had not really changed their penal system since the time of the fall of the Bastille. So in, so in like 200 years, um, it's, it's pretty barbaric, actually. So he's put in solitary confinement, no windows in his cell, uh, no even bars on his door. Like it's a solid door. Um, there's no toilet in his jail cell. So they have sort of a three-tier, like there's a, it's almost like a built-in bench that goes around his cell, and then there's the floor, and then there's a, a little pit in the center, and that's where he gets to use the bathroom. And they come through and I think clean it out once a week for him. So you're kind of just living in your own filth, basically. Um, and food comes through a little door, you know, the classic door on the floor of the cell, you know, that they slide the tray in through. Um, I think a couple times a day, like it was just really. And so he um, he gets thrown in jail there without really like even. Kind of, like he knows what he's caught for, but it's like there's not a lot of English being spoken in France, obviously. And then finally, about two weeks in, he figures it's about two weeks. Well, he finds out after the fact it's about two weeks in because he can't see the sun. He has no t idea of like the passage of time. Really, his only way to figure out what the you know try and remember what day it is is just remembering how many meals he's been served there. But this throws him off because I think it's two a day instead of three. So he, like, it's just like it's this bizarro world, right? But he, he gets told afterwards about two weeks, a representative of the U.S. government from their consulate in Paris comes to check on him. And this guy knock, you know, comes to the door or whatever, and he's immediately relieved. He's like, oh, they finally they figured out I'm here. They're going to let me out. Uh, you know, this ordeal is over. The guy from the consulate says, "No, sorry, I'm not. I'm not here to spring you from jail. Like, you've been arrested in France for crimes you committed on French soil. You have to, you have to serve a sentence here." He says, "But this is like barbaric conditions." And and the guy says, "We can we can file a protest with the French government if you are being treated more harshly than other prisoners. But this is you're getting the same treatment as everybody else." And so this guy's just like. So he he serves out whatever is the remainder of his 10 months or something that he's in this jail. But he says at the end of it, so from France, he gets extradited to Sweden. And he's talking to his lawyer that they've assigned to him. And he's like, I can't go back to jail. Like, I'm going to be tried in Sweden. And it's going to be this all over again. And it's a Swedish lawyer. And the guy's, the guy's clearly not getting what this guy, what Frank is laying down. Like, he's confused. And he starts describing everything that's going on in the French prison. He's like, oh, no, no. Like he, and he starts describing a, a Swedish, basically most Scandinavian prisons by that point. It was like, it was kind of like 
being confined to a college campus. Like that was how he described it afterwards. Like we kind of had freedom of the lawn, like we could wander around the facility. I was taking courses and things like that. And so greatly relieved when he gets to Sweden. But on looking back on it, he said, you know, obviously the meals were not great. The solitary confinement was trying. The lack of a toilet was a big deal. But he said the hardest thing while he was imprisoned was there was no lights in his cell. So the only time there was light in his cell was when that little door got opened in the hallway and they would slide his food tray in. And he said, as he got accustomed to the darkness, when they'd open up that, that door, it was like a blinding light that would come out. And he realized afterwards, it was like actually they purposely kept, kept the lights dim in the hallway. Like it was, for the guards, it was just enough for them to get around and, and see the cells because it was so bright to him. He says, you know, afterwards when I was actually released, like, you know, I had to, he had to hold his eyes shut for hours at a time sometimes because he'd become accustomed to zero visible light. And he said that was the hardest thing. Like, you, you know, trying to keep track of days, it's like, well, if you can't see anything that you can write, then you can't do that. And, and the passage of time, of course, you know, there's no day, there's no night, there's just always darkness. And he said that, that was the hardest part of, of his confinement. And I think sometimes we take that for granted, don't we? Just having light in our world. Um, you know, we li live in Bonacord, our dark sky community. Um, and it is ubiquitous, right? Like it's, you know, we are so well lit. Um, I re remember Leanne telling me about getting a ride back from the airport or something. And, and <laughs> hence the cabbie was from the city and it's just like the, the street lights ended and panic set in. Like... <laughs> But we're just used to it. Everything around us is so well lit. We're not accustomed to darkness. Um, but I think the Jews of Jesus' day figured that out when Jesus got up and said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What a powerful image, and especially for the Israelites wandering around the desert in darkness, to have a constant sort of source of light, not only illuminating the surroundings, but guiding them was a powerful image. And so that's where we're diving in this morning. We're actually going to try and cruise through the entire chapter here today, so I'm not going to hold us up too much. But there's three crucial statements that we're going to um, look at. Uh, and two of them start with I am. Uh, so the, the beginning of our passage this morning, it's I am the light of the world. And we end off with um, Jesus uh, stating, very truly I tell you before Abraham was born, I am. And that's sort of our, those are kind of our end, our bookends on uh, this morning's passage. But let's pick it up in John 12. And contemplate this, this statement that Jesus makes, that I am the light of the world. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now the, the Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. And Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid or true, we might say, for I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. So if you remember from a couple weeks back, this was, we had some back and forth on this already um, about uh, the validity of Jesus' testimony and also his origin. But carrying on, it says, you judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. So that was kind of like a baseline uh, rule of thumb from the... the uh, Mosaic laws, especially in serious crimes, you couldn't just rely on the testimony of one person. You needed two or three wit witnesses to an event to establish how it all went down. And of course, we have similar jurisprudence today. So Jesus is claiming not only his own testimony, but he's saying the Father testifies on his behalf. We have the advantage of reading this, and somebody has helpfully capitalized 
capital F for father there. So we know who he's talking about. But in verse 19, they then ask him, where is your father? Small f. They don't know who Jesus is talking about. He says, you do not know me or my father. Jesus replied, if you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. So we have already in John this, you know, plots sort of swirling around Jesus, but we're told it's not because there was a lack of animosity f toward Jesus or a lack of opportunity, it's because his time was, had not come. He was not ready to be glorified. Once more, Jesus said to them, I am going away, and you will look for me, and you can't, you will find, Sorry, you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. And this made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he's saying, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Who are you? They asked. Just what I've been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy. And what I have heard from him, I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have li lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am he. And I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed in him. So Jesus, by comparing himself with the Father, putting himself in relationship with God the Father, it was a very clear, would have been much more clear to the Jews than maybe it is to us, that he's claiming sonship with the Father, that he's claiming to be the Messiah. He's being to be claiming to be God himself. Uh, and sometimes this is kind of debated uh, among people, especially as you get into um, even groups sort of parallel with or outside of Christianity. If you have a Mormon maybe come to your door, this is one of the places they'll go and say, well, no, Jesus isn't claiming to be God. He's claiming to be something other than, because he keeps referring to God as his father and him separate from that. And we'll get to that to the, at the end. I don't, think, I don't think it was confusing for the Jews of Jesus today. They knew exactly uh, who he was claiming to be. But if we go right back to that first statement, I am the light of the world. You know, even as we talked about it here, uh, one of the kids said, you know, if he is referring to that pillar of fire in the desert... And claiming to be that, putting himself in that place, you know, what did that, that pillar of fire represent to Israel? God, right? It was as simple as that. He says, I am that light. And if you don't have me, you're wandering around in darkness. You don't know the Father. You don't know the core of reality. And we can only access that light. We can only stand in that light as we are in Jesus. And as he places us in the center of uh, who God is and, and what he has taught. But we come to a second sta saying here that's uh, pretty well known in the next part. But as uh, I was thinking about this, I was thinking of another, um, well, somewhat well-known uh, prisoner to some of us by the name of uh, Chuck Colson. So if you're familiar with, you know, sort of the Christian... Uh, apologetic scene, uh, then you probably read a book by him or seen, seen his name on a book. But if you uh, were watching the news in 1974, you'd be familiar with the name Chuck Colson because he was one of the chief uh, legal counsels of Richard Nixon. And he was kind of his hatchet man, actually. Like, if there was something, you know, ignominious deed that needed to be done, Chuck Colson was the guy that got sent in to do it. And, of course, in 1974, there was the Watergate scandal where it was revealed that uh, Nixon and some of his closest circle were actually spying on things uh, that were happening at the Democratic headquarters. And Chuck Colson was up to his ears in it. Uh, and so he would be eventually be indicted and spend time in prison uh, because of it. And he was a he was a 
powerful man, he was an influential man, but he would, in describing that period of his life, say that, you know, as much as he had authority in that chapter of his life, after he was arrested and put in prison was when his life began to take on significance. Chuck Colson would say that because he met Jesus. Uh, in prison. He became a Christian, a born-again believer, uh, and would go on, to, as soon as he got out of prison, he immediately started a volunteer organization called Prison Fellowship to minister to prisoners and ex-cons, and just sort of the least of these, as Jesus would put it in the Gospels. And so Chuck Colson credits that really to this time of being in prison. And in a sort of a backwards way, he says, you know, if I'd never been convicted, I'd never been caught in it, I, wouldn't, I would never have known the freedom of knowing Jesus Christ. It was only by realizing his sin, his need for Jesus, his need for redemption, that he could actually live a life of freedom in Jesus. And so Jesus, you will get to a well-known phrase here, but, but I wanted to bring that up because I think that's important as we talk about freedom, especially, you know, we, we were all, most of us were in Alberta through COVID and we heard a lot of the term freedom bandied around. When Jesus says it, it means something a little different. We need to pay attention to that. Um, you know, Paul will later talk in Galatians about, uh, you know, using our freedom to follow Jesus Christ, to obey his commands. And he explicitly says, you know, freedom, he says, you are, you are free now, so you are not to do whatever you want to do. Which is like, that's kind of counterintuitive to us, isn't it, right? It's like, well, if I'm free, I can do whatever I want. And, and Paul says explicitly, it's like, actually, no, that's, that's beside the point. You're free so that you can do whatever God wants you to do. So let's, let's dive into how Jesus explains this. And interestingly, it says in verse 31, it's to the Jews who had believed him. And I want you to kind of clock it into your mind here, because as we get into it, it really sounds like he's talking to his opponents. It really it sounds like he's talking to religious people who d are disagreeing with him. But no, he's kind of preaching to the choir here at this point, and yet he's pretty harsh with them. <laughs> so to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. So it's not about banging the drum. Uh, it's not about how many uh, praise songs we have memorized. It's about holding to Jesus' teaching. And he says, if you do that, then you are really my disciples. Verse 32, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And boy, hasn't that been a um, phrase that's been well-worn over the years, right? Um, and, and I feel like I, I, when I hear a politician use those words, all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, I get. Have you ever, I don't know if you've seen those news articles where it's like a band uh, has their song used during a political rally and they've not given the okay on that and they're just like, hey, we don't endorse this person or whatever. It's like, that's, that song, I don't, and especially when it's like the song is like very, con the artist is, has views very contrary to what the politician stands for. You know, what's the, the line from the Princess Bride? Um, I, don't, I don't think you know what that re word really means. I'd hate, to, you know, I'd hate for you to be using it in the wrong way. That, yeah, I, I start squirming when I hear a politician saying, you know, something to the effect of, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus says clearly, this is about his teaching and being his disciple. That is the truth that we are to run after. But it carries on. It says, then they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Which is, okay, that's, you know, weird sidebar, but it's like the Jewish nation up to this point, it's like there's, there's n virtually nobody in the, the ancient Near East and the Mediterranean that hasn't conquer conquered Judah by this point, right? So it's like they've, they're actually quite used to having people rule over them. But Jesus replies, he says, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. 
Well, Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. I was, as I was studying this week, a lot of commentators thought, maybe that's, that might be a subtle dig at Jesus and you know, trying to figure out who his actual father is, right? Because they, they're pretty sure it's not Joseph. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own, God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Eugene uh, Peterson's son. Uh, Peterson relates a, a, a story of his son um, as a college student. He goes off to college and but growing up uh, his son would often say of his dad you, you know if you asked him about his preaching he'd say oh it was it was fine but you know it was the same sermon <laughs> same sermon you preach every Sunday basically uh, and, and Peterson always took that aback of like oh like I don't think he gets what I'm saying like I'm you know I'm really striving and he's a very scholarly guy uh, really striving to bring out the text to people and get them the, the message of scripture and he just felt like his oldest son wasn't getting it because he would just keep saying well it's the same sermon you preach every Sunday dad um, but then he went off to college and came back and Peterson was uh, grilling his son on on church you know where are you attending you know how do you like it what's it like and all this and and um, and he says, no, no, it's good things. Talks a bit about programs and things like that. And, and he asked the, then his, his dad finally asked his son, you know, but what do you think about the preaching? And he says, well, the sermon, the pastor hasn't found his sermon yet. <laughs> and he says, then it clicked. He had actually been complimenting the whole time, me the whole time. That he, you know, that this was his way of saying, you, ha you have a consistent voice. You have something that, that you carry with you in every message, and you preach out of that. Um, he said, yeah, this, pa this young pastor that he was with didn't, wasn't quite there yet. Um, but that's, I think one of the things... I don't know, I love about John, I hope y you learn to love about John, is he's got one sermon. Like, he's kind of got one thing that he's pushing, and it just keeps coming around and around in a lot of ways. And I, as I'm reading chapter 8, it's like, yeah, we're right in the thick of it here, right? Like, we keep hearing, you know, we're talking about truth and lies, we're talking about light and darkness, we're talking about either being in God or out of God. You know, it's one or the other. Either you're with God or you're against him. Uh, and, and talking about love. And, I, you know, if you, if you read this chapter and then go and read the epistle of 1 John later in the New Testament, it's like, it's, it's, just, it's like you're on repeat, you know, every chapter, right? It's like the same, we, we're talking about the same five things all the way through this chapter and, and 1 John. So we start with a statement about, about being in the truth, and then he says, you, you know, now if the, the sun sets you free, then you are free indeed, uh, and, and living in the truth. But of course we have the contrast, and he says, you know, you're not in the truth. If, he, if you were in God, if you, if you were in the truth, you would recognize the truth of my teaching, but you're not. You're on a different track. You're, you're on the track of your father. The devil, he says, and the devil speaks his native language in lies. He, he abhors the truth. And he's a murderer from the beginning. He doesn't come to bring life. And so Jesus, you know, is painting a clear contrast for us. You know, he is the light of the world. And that, that light was the life, uh, as John puts it in chapter 1. 
So it's, you know, it's, it's lies and death on one side, it's darkness, and on the other side it is God, it is the Father, it is the truth, and it is life that, that John is painting for us. And we get to choose. And, but it's because of Jesus. You know, they're, they're off on this track about, you know, being Abraham's descendants, and we could go down a long rabbit trail there. But that was a big deal for the Jews, obviously, was their lineage. And saying, you know, we, we are descended from Abraham, and that was sort of like a, a big check mark on their spiritual um, checklist, right? To, to say, yeah, we got that covered. We're from the right family. Um, we've got this figured out. And Jesus says, no, no, your lineage is based on what you do. It's not, it's not on, you know, your ancestry. Uh, it's not on, you know, thinking your people are cut above everybody else. He says it's, it's what you do. You know, if you do the works of your father, if you, if you lie and, and live in lies and darkness, then, then we know which one you're on. If you live in the truth, then we know who your father is as well. I... Uh, remember my father-in-law one time describing himself as a golfer and uh, I just thought that was the strangest because he hated golf he worked at a worked at a golf club when he was like 18 and just despised everybody that was that well that's maybe a strong word but he, he did not enjoy that jo that job and uh, and uh, Afterwards, you know, after I inherited his golf clubs, I'd really only confirmed me in it because it was like, you know, this old bag with I think like four four clubs, and I pick one up and it's a lefty. And it's, I, actually, no, I saw it in his garage actually when when uh, when he was still with us, and I asked him about. It. He says, "Well, you know, in case I want to switch it up sometime, you know, just <laughs> okay." <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So then, uh, so then, yeah, I caught him one time. He described himself as a golfer. He was he was going out with some friends or whatever. I was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know you. I, I I wouldn't think of you in those terms, Roy. And he says to me, he says, well, I've been golfing, so I must be a golfer. <laughs> says, how many times do you have to sin to be a sinner, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's that's precisely John's point. Is you know is is our actions describe us far better than our you know however we might describe ourselves, right? Um, our actions put us in that in that place. But this is all coming to a point. Like there's you know Jesus describes himself as the light of the world. He says, if you remain in my teaching, if you're really my disciples, you will know the truth. You know, we've got this, this idea of living in the light, knowing where we are going, got, being guided, living by Jesus' teaching, uh, knowing the truth and, and the reality of the world around us. And this is leading us to sort of the, the peak of the chapter, which comes right at the end. The, the ultimate revelation, the, the light reveals something to us. The truth reveals something to us. And it's not just a fact, it's a person. So verse 48, it says, The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are Samaritan and demon-possessed? I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. So again, you know, light, darkness, life, and death. At this they exclaimed, Now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say, Whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? And John is, you know, sort of just setting up the the bowling pin so, so Jesus can knock them down, right? Like, we've already had this discussion, actually, with Moses. Are you greater than Moses? And we kind of get John subtly insinuating, like, yes, this guy's beyond Moses. Um, and now we're going to hear Jesus reply about, uh, you know, who do you think you are? Jesus replies, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. And we have two separate statements, statements throughout the Gospel of John, right? Of, Je of the Holy Spirit coming down on Jesus and saying, this is my beloved son. So to the father placing that stamp of approval on Jesus. Jesus says, though you do not know me, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and I obey his word. 
Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. So this is a loaded statement, obviously. We, we kind of get the idea that Jesus is essentially claiming that he existed sometime before Abraham was born, uh, thousands of years before the time that Jesus actually walked the earth and was born to Mary. Um, so we, we, we get on, the, in our, our English translation preserves that for us of understanding this claim to be pre-existent. Um, but he makes his claim to be God is actually even more clear uh, to the Jews of his day because the words I am are actually the name Yahweh, the name of God himself. And it was such a sacred name that they actually wouldn't even say it out loud at the time. And they wouldn't write it. They would write one of God's other names or Adonai. Um, they, they had a lot of standards. It was such a sacred thing and Jesus just blurts it out. And not just not just to say it, but to claim that he is God himself. And if we miss, as I said, you know, if the Mormons uh, miss this explicit message, verse 49, 59, sorry, clears it up for us, the final verse of chapter 8. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Capital punishment was reserved for pretty serious crimes, and one of them was the blasphemous claiming to be God himself. This is the revelation that we've been building up to in this chapter. This is the declaration we've been looking forward to. Jesus is the light of the world because he is God himself. What is the truth that will set you free? It's the knowledge that Jesus is God. And it's through that lens then we can see the world clearly. It's through that lens we can really be Jesus' disciples and know the truth, know, know reality at its bedrock. Jesus says, if you know you build your life on my teachings, that's the only firm foundation in life. That is the truth that we have to hold on to. As we come to the end this morning, we're going to celebrate communion actually together and and I, I thought it's interesting that, again, John ties up this issue of truth, not just with, we, we tend to think of that as like facts, right? And, um, you know, uh, logic, but there's a passion to truth as well for Jesus. There's, a, there's his person involved. It's not just the truth of, okay, these, you know, memorize these five points and have your theology correct, but it's like there's the truth experienced in Jesus Christ himself. And John ties that up in the, the Passion story. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead again here uh, to the end of uh, chapter 18 in his gospel. And there's this little interchange between uh, Pilate and Jesus right at the end. Verse 33 says, Then Pilate then went back inside the palace after he's questioned Jesus, goes back out, talks to the leaders, comes back in. And he summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. And of course, famously, Pilate retorts, what is truth? But Jesus says the whole reason he came in was to reveal the truth, to testify to it. By his very nature, being in the world reveals that to us. The, authors, the author of Hebrews will tell us, you know, the, the prophets of the Old Testament came and, and gave, sent a message, but when God really wanted to get the word across, he revealed himself in the Son. That was the truth revealed to us. And the most 
as John will t talk about in the crucifixion and show in the crucifixion, what Jesus is most clearly revealed to us in his death, in his suffering. And as we come to communion, we realize we're witness, we have been witnesses to the truth. If we have understood, if we've comprehended the unfathomable love of God for us in his death for us, in paying for our sins, and in the resurrection, knowing his life in us. So I'm going to take a minute here and uh, just pray, lead us in prayer, and then I'll distribute the elements. We do practice open communion at our church, so you don't have to be a church member uh, to participate. Uh, we just ask that if you're a Christian, you, you feel welcome uh, with us. And if you're not at the place of uh, obeying Jesus' teaching, of being his disciple, then we just ask that you observe. Let's take a moment and pray. Lord, you have sent Jesus to us, and we thank you for the record that John provided, that his words are still alive to us in a very real way today, thousands of years later. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, that he did come and bring the truth to us, that he brought your life to us, and it's only in experiencing that life, Lord, that we can have freedom from sin that we can walk in light and not stumble around in darkness, so that, that we can be free from the prison, the slavery that sin would normally hold over us. Lord, as we uh, take communion this morning, as we are reminded of the sacrifice of Jesus, we pray that we would walk in freedom this week. That as we go from here, there would be a renewed sense of not just commitment, us trying harder, Lord, but being upheld in a community and encouraged to really be your disciples. That through your spirit, your, whole, your resurrection power would live in us in such a way that we walk in the truth. And that we have our lives founded on it. So Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus to reveal that ultimately to us. We thank you for the spirit sent with the power of the resurrection to give us new life. In Jesus' name, amen.